Chris Tackett, the pianist for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson. Welcome to my living room. Stick around after the postlude, and I'll be happy to tell you about all the music I played. Just what if we were to have a rummage sale? We as in the Baha Four, we as in your congregations. You know what? We are in the middle of a rummage sale and you'll hear more about that later. But for now, just imagine if your congregation was having a rummage sale, what would it clean out? How about that chair with the missing cushion and maybe three good legs? Or what about that carpet that's been there for a few decades with a hole in it from where someone tripped and dropped a candle? What about those dusty books? Could any of us bear to part with maybe a few of them? All of this might go out to your rummage sale or get fixed or repurposed so it could be used for another time. Now imagine if all of Unitarian Universalism had a rummage sale. What would we do with those things that we can't hold? What would we do with the committees and the agendas, the worships and the fellowships, the songs and the words, the principles and the sources, the cultures and the habits, if we did an inventory of all of this and we were aiming for some type of rummage sale, if we followed Marie Kondo's process from the uh, life-changing magic of tidying up, we would hold each of these metaphorical things in our hands, in our actual hands, and ask, 
does this spark joy? Does worship spark joy? Does social hour spark joy? Does that committee spark joy? Does our governance spark joy? Does your congregation spark joy? Does Unitarian Universalism spark joy? If something sparks joy in Marie Kondo's process, we keep it, find a place for it, label it clearly. If it does not spark joy, we release it, let it go, let it find a new home. About the releasing, Marie Kondo writes, when we really delve into the reasons for why we can't let something go, there are only two. An attachment to the past or a fear of the future. What of our past are we attached to? What of our future do we fear? How will we prepare for our future rummage sale? Today's chalice lighting was written by the Reverend Leslie Takahashi. I invite you to light a chalice or candle as I light mine. All that we have ever loved and all that we have ever been stands with us on the brink of all that we aspire to create a deeper peace, a larger love, a more embracing hope, a deeper joy in this life we share. Friends, I know many of you just got up, but as you can see, I'm in my pajamas and I have a nice warm snuggly blanket and I have a furry friend here with me today to tell you 
this story because it's a bedtime story. It's called A Lamp in Every Corner. It happened a long time ago in a place far, far away called Transylvania. Transylvania sounds like it's a fairy town, but it's actually a real place. And in Transylvania, in a tiny little village on the side of a mountain, there's a group of people that decided they were ready to build themselves a church. Now they did everything they needed to. They scouted around and they found the best location in the city. It was on the side of a mountain where the church could overlook the whole community like a parent looking down on their children. So all the people of the village labored long and hard to build themselves a church. Finally, finally, when the building of the church was done, the painting of the church could begin. The painters mixed bright colors, royal red and shimmering gold and brilliant blue, and everyone in the village, old and young, women and men, boys, girls, and everyone, came to decorate their church. They painted flowers, they painted trees, they painted designs around the windows and differing designs around the doors. And at the end of the day, when it was finished, when their church was finally done, all the people of, of the village stood back to admire it and then to sing a song of happiness and praise. Their village had a church now, a church set on the hillside, looking down upon the village as a parent looks upon a sleeping child. We will eat now, announced an elder of the village because everyone was hungry after their long day's work. And later tonight, we will come back to pray. So the people of the village went down the hillside to their homes and their suppers, all except for a little child named Zora and Zora's father who stayed behind. After they had eaten, they went back inside, opening those carved wooden doors to go into the gloriously painted sanctuary inside. Oh, look, Father, Zora cried, running from picture to picture, footsteps echoing off the stone walls. See how pretty the church is? Zora stopped in the center of the church and twirled slowly around. See how grand? Yes, it is, said Zora's father, looking around and nodding with pride. It is, but Father, Zora stopped suddenly. We have not finished. What do you mean? asked Father. There are tall iron lamp stands all around the walls, but there are no lamps. The church will be dark when the people come back. Ah, no little one, said Father. The light of the church comes from its people. You shall see. He rang the bell to call the people to worship, then took the child by the hand and back outside. They waited on the grassy hillside next to their beautiful church of strong gray stone. The sun had set behind the mountains and night was coming soon. Yet in the glowing darkness, tiny points of light came from many directions and moved steadily up the hill. Each family is entrusted with a lamp, little one, Zora's father explained. Each family lights its own way here. Where's our family's lamp? Your mother is carrying it. She will soon be here. The many lights moved closer together, gathering into one moving stream, all headed the same way, growing larger and brighter all the time. Zora's mother arrived, bearing a burning oil lamp. The father lifted Zora so they could set their family's light high into its iron, tall iron stand. All around the church, other families were doing the same. Soon the church was ablaze with light in every corner, for all the people of the village had gathered to pray and to sing. All through the worship service, Zora watched the lights flicker and grow, glow. She watched her family's lamp most of all. When the service was over, Zora's father lifted her high. She took the shining bronze lamp from the lampstand. The lamp flame lit their house when they returned home. Zora washed her face, got ready for bed by the light of that flame. Mother, Zora began, 
as she climbed into bed and laid down. Yes, little one, her mother asked, tucking the red wool blanket around Zora's shoulders. Father said the light of the church comes from the people. Yes, but also the people take their lights from the church. Over on the table by the fireplace, the shiny bronze lamp was still burning. And we have the light every day. Yes, indeed, said her mother. And even when we are not in church, even when the lamp is not lit, we carry the light of our truth in our minds and the flame of love in our hearts to show us the right way to be. That light, the light from truth and love, will never go out. The years passed, Zora grew. The bronze lamp came into her care. She kept it polished and clean, and when the bell rang out across the valley to call the people to worship, she carried the lamp back and forth to the church on the hillside, the flame always lighting her way. When the time came, she made more lamps and gave them to her children, who made more lamps and gave them to their children. And so it went on through the years, even until today. And always the light of truth and the flame of love from the Unitarian Church on the hillside continued to grow and show them and us the way. <laughs> I have a confession to make. It took all of 30 minutes of one of Marie Kondo's Netflix shows for me to take my laptop show still playing to my bedroom and refold all of my clothing. For those of you who haven't been part of this craze that happened sometime in 2019. Marie Kondo is the author I referenced in the call to worship. She wrote a book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up and then had a Netflix TV show modeling uh, what she wrote about in that book. And she has encourages each of us to decide what to keep and what to let go of by holding every single thing we own in the palms of our hands and asking, does this spark joy? Does this spark joy? If the answer is yes, this sparks joy for me, you keep it, you store it neatly and nicely. There are lots of rules you can follow if you're a rule person. There's a whole diagram for how to fold clothing. Everything has its place if you keep it. And if the answer is no, this doesn't actually spark joy. You let it go to the Goodwill bins and the thrift stores and the trash bins. I have another confession to make. I never actually did that process of letting go that Marie Kondo says is supposed to happen first. I just got super excited about this new way to fold clothing and rent and refolded every single piece of clothing I own. I did not do the joy, no joy, discernment process. That was far too scary for me. The idea of giving up things is really, really scary. I imagine some of you feel sad, maybe even angered, by some of the things that we just expressed a desire to maybe let go of in our pseudo rummage sale just now. That sadness and that anger is real, and I wanna honor that and say that I hear you and I see you. And I also want to emphasize that this is not my rummage sale, and it's not your rummage sale. This is our rummage sale. We need to inventory and reflect together as congregations, as a Baha for, as an entire faith of Unitarian Universalism, what sparks joy and what doesn't spark joy? What will we keep 
for the next 500 years and what do we need to let go of in order to move forward? Let's start first with the things that spark joy. Those essential objects and traditions like the one carried, the lamps carried from Transylvanian homes to light up the church, the lamps that were passed down from generation to generation, whether physically passed down or made anew and replicated and passed down with those sacred traditions. Let's start with the things that spark joy because a writer and activist, Adrienne Marie Brown and others say, what we pay attention to grows. What we pay attention to grows. And if we focus on those things that spark joy, those things we want to grow, we start to imagine the faith we are becoming and the letting go becomes just a little bit easier. We Americans and global residents and people of faith, we are at a turning point. In an article and a movie titled Coronavirus Capitalism, Canadian author and activist Naomi Klein writes that, quote, during moments of cataclysmic change, the previously unthinkable suddenly becomes reality. Klein here is inspired by the late free market economist Milton Friedman, who said that, quote, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. Only a crisis produces real change. When that crisis occurs, Friedman writes, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. Klein points out that in the wake of disaster, the ideas that often get enacted are those that support the wealthy and further divide the rich from the poor. However, she points out it is possible for ideas that bridge wealth gaps and societal divisions to be enacted in the wakes of cataclysmic change. Klein says, quote, the future will be determined by whoever is willing to fight harder for the ideas they have laying around. We, average citizens engaged with our democracy, need to pick up, pay attention to, and to seek to enact those good ideas laying around now in this wake of cataclysmic change in this midst of cataclysmic change. This time is a project for reshaping our lives, for fortifying our society so that it serves all people, for reinventing our congregations so that we can be alive for the next 500 year rummage sale. Over the next six weeks, we, your Baha for ministers and musicians and religious educators, will be exploring what we are, what we believe we are being asked to do in this time, to reimagine church, to reinvent church. Know that we did not choose this rummage sale. It just started happening. Know that some people have been waiting for this rummage sale for a long time long time. We reinvent church by asking ourselves, does this spark joy? Does this give us life? Does this bring us closer to beloved community? Does this lead us towards, towards liberation for all? Committee meetings and agendas, worship and fellowship, songs and words, culture and habits, what of this sparks joy? What will we pay attention to in order to grow it? What good ideas are lying around that we can pick up and enact now? The work of this faith is in 
our hands. The work of this world is ours to do. May we be faithful to the wisdom of our ancestors and the calling of children not yet born to build something bigger and better than any of us could have built alone. These bananas represent being perfect. Perfection in our churches does not bring me joy. I want us to let go of trying to be perfect. It happens every time we think the church is a place where if we don't do it right, then we or they must be bad. And it happens every time we refuse to show each other our bruised selves. And when we make mistakes or others make mistakes or cause harm, what do we do? We split. These bananas represent being related. Relatedness does bring me joy. I want us to hold on to being related. It happens every time that we know church is the place where we practice being in relationship rather than practice being perfect. And we show each other where we're bruised and our soft spots and how we're changing. And it happens every time we make a mistake or cause harm and we stick around to transform it into something sweeter, like banana bread. For my ordination, I was gifted two vessels of water, a mason jar of sump pump water, and a small Erlenmeyer flask with a drop of water from the Vatican and some water from a lake in New York State and some water from the church kitchen sink. The sump pump water does not bring me joy. A sump pump, for those of you who don't know, is something you use to get water out of basements when you don't want that water in your basement. And the, the sump pump in my internship church flooded hmm, two to three times a year after a capital campaign to try to remediate the flooding. I hope in the future we can find ways to make our buildings and the places that allow us to gather and worship more sustainable and less of a headache for all of us. The Erlenmeyer flask does bring me joy. It reminds us that some of us, reminds me that some of us find holiness in formal religious traditions and some of us find holiness in nature and some of us uh, find holiness in science. 
And we all meet and are held by the same thing, our Unitarian Universalist faith. This is a Lego figure moving. It represents active worship, which gets people engaged and ready to transform the world around them. And it brings me joy because it gives me hope for the future. This is a Lego figure frozen to a Lego pew. It represents passive worship, which only requires people to sit still. This does not bring me joy because it feels like looking backwards, not knowing where you are or where you're going. This is toilet paper. To me, it represents fear-based decision-making because in March, so many people went out to the stores and bought masses of toilet paper that some of us couldn't get the toilet paper when we needed it. Um, it doesn't bring me joy because it reminds me of the least desirable qualities we have as human beings and of the limitations of a scarcity mindset. This is my favorite quote. I'll read it. Entspanne dich, lass das Steuer los, trüldel durch die Welt, sie ist so schön. Relax, let go of the wheel, wander through the world, it is so beautiful. And that's by Kurt Tucholsky. And uh, this quote to me represents possibility and openness to what, um, what comes next, even when we're not sure what it is. This sits on my dresser where I see it every morning. It brings me great joy because it reminds me of a mindset of abundance. My two objects are photographs from the 1960s. The first tells a story that does not bring me joy, a story that never actually happened. It's a movie still from the 1963 film, Lord of the Flies, which many of us were forced to watch in English class. At 13, I did not agree with the premise of this movie, that English boys stranded together on an island would inevitably become violent and murderous with one another. I'm so grateful that Unitarian Universalism has thrown out original sin, but unfortunately, the idea of it lies deep within the bones of our culture. At some level, the story makes sense because we wonder, could those boys have been inherently evil? The journalist Rutger Bergman did not like the story either, and he hunted for a true one. The second photograph was taken in 1968, two years after six Tongan boys were rescued from an island. And by 1968, they were working on a fishing boat. In 1965, they escaped their boarding school by borrowing a fishing boat. And because they fell asleep and didn't set a watch, the rudder and sail broke, and they ended up stranded on the island of Atta. They lived for 15 months and created order for themselves. If they fought, they separated. There was always someone on watch looking for ships and someone tending the fire. And after 15 months, they hailed an Australian fisherman who took them home and eventually hired them and brought them into his life. If my boys are forced to watch Lord of the Flies, I will talk to them about original sin and I will offer them the story of these Tongans and how even though human beings can be flawed and nearsighted and horribly cruel to each other, we are not inherently evil. We can change, we can grow. And with good cooperation, even teenage boys can survive. These are the bylaws of Borderlands UU. And this is our covenant. Of course, we all have both. Well, one represents the institution, the 501c3 not-for-profit entity, the leadership structure, the building, finances, represents our organization. And the other represents the aspirations of a congregation, our meaning, 
our yearning, and our purpose. And one hand then is the body and the other hand is the soul and they symbolize duality. Now, binary opposites are embedded in the English language and so they underpin much of our society. We all have both and each separately is necessary and yet the duality has never brought me joy. Unitarian Universalists that I've witnessed today who live out our faith in this pandemic, they've shown me that living in deep relationship, the dualities come together and they become whole. The relationship of body and soul, of us and them, of I and of we, is a wholeness beyond the parts we all are one. And this, this brings me joy. Episcopal Bishop Mark Dwyer, who came up with a description that every 500 years, the Western Church has had such a large shift, it's as if it's had a giant rummage sale. Phyllis Tickle took this idea, expanded it, and made it famous. She shows that every half millennium, there's such a large shift that the church has to decide what structures to keep, what old rituals to renew, and which ones to let go. And she shows how every 500 years it happens within the Western side of Christianity, and even back before the time of Christ in Proto-Judaism. She notes that roughly 500 years ago, in 1517, Luther publishes his 95 Theses, and get, that gets the Reformation really moving forward. 500 years before that was the Great Schism of 1054, which divided the Church into Catholicism in the West and Orthodoxy of the East. Half a millennium before that, you had the fall of Rome. 500 years before that, well, Jesus Christ, created some changes within a part of Judaism. 500 years before that, you had the second temple and the end of the Babylonian exile. And half a millennium before that was the end of the time of Judges. 
So you see this pattern has been throughout our religious history. And Tickle says we should take comfort in that because right now we're going through something called the Great Emergence in which the church is shifting once again. We see that many people call themselves spiritual but not religious, and many want to move beyond denominations. It's a scary time, but we should take comfort in several things that have happened repeatedly in the past. First, Tickle says that whoever starts out as a strong institution at the beginning of the time of change has to step back, but doesn't cease to exist. The Reformation may have cut down on the power of the Catholic Church, but it still exists. And a second thing happens. The new form of faith that starts to grow flourishes throughout the world. There's a great burgeoning of faith. And thirdly, it's always about a question of authority. So at the time of the Reformation, the reformers looked at what had given authority to the Catholic Church and pointed out that the Pope and Curia were corrupt. It took a while to find the new authority, but they eventually trusted in scripture alone. For the past 150 years, we have questioned that authority because we see how human beings can take this word of God and interpret it conveniently in ways that help differing groups. So right now we're looking for a new authority. We're undergoing a huge shift. But every time there's a shift within the church, it happens because of a larger change within society. The Reformation happened in response to bigger trends, the rise of capitalism, the rise of nation states, and then religious institutions had to catch up and change and adapt. Right now, even before COVID, do you remember that time? Even before then, many of our institutions were in flux. Our newspapers are shutting down. Our universities and libraries and churches have been working to reinvent themselves to be relevant to this new world. So we're undergoing a change and it's scary, but we should remember, we have done this before. We will come out the other side with new life, new energy, new vision. Courage, Courage. My, friend. my friend, you do not, not walk, walk alone. We will, we will walk with you, walk with you, and sing and your spirit home. Courage, Courage, my friend, my friend, you do, do not, not walk, walk alone. alone. We will, we will walk with you, walk with you, and sing. Extinguish your chalices with me now, and listen to these words from Reverend Margaret Weiss. These are called, The Church Has Left the Building. The Church 
is not a place. It is a people. The church is not only a steeple above the tree lines and streets and cars, rather a people proclaiming to the world that we are here for the work of healing and justice. The church is not walls built stone upon stone held together by mortar, but rather persons linked with persons, linked with persons of all ages and genders and abilities, a community built on a foundation of reason and faith and love. The church is not just a set of doors open on Sunday mornings, but the commitment day after day and moment after moment of our hearts creaking open the doors of welcome to the possibility of new experiences and radical welcome. The church is not simply a building or a steeple or a pew. The church is the gathering together of all the people and experiences and fears and loves and hopes in our resilient hearts gathering however we can to say to the world, welcome, come in, lay down your heartache and pick up hope and love. For the church is us, each and every one of us together, a beacon of the hope to this world that so sorely needs it. Amen. May we come to know it is so, and blessed be.
That, of course, is the old Sacred Heart tune, Holy Manna. It's in the Unitarian Hymn number 66, When the Summer Sun is Shining. Beautiful May Day for that. The other big tune of the day was What Wondrous Love Is This? Another one from the Sacred Heart tradition. Just a gorgeous tune and one of my all-time favorites. The Holy Manna arrangement is based off of an improvisation that uh, Steve Bren and I used to do. We used to improvise organ and piano duets. Oh, good Lord, almost 20 years ago. And that was one of our big favorites. We gave a couple concerts. We did a number of things around town, but uh, miss him very much. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you.